Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. Break out your malice miser. It's time for another exciting episode. But you're giving me a weird look. Would you uh, prefer I go with Duran Gray? Oh through my doing, God, stop. <laughs> through doing Awesome Start, I Awesome Start is a thing, by the way, that I used to program for awesomestart.com. Check that shit out. Uh, I've learned all about Japanese rock music. Oh, okay. And so today I'm bringing my... <laughs> now I get it. The only thing I know about Japan, which is their rock music. To be honest with you, I don't even really understand that. At this point... I believe, uh, by the way, my name's Eric. Uh, this is Michael. Hey, I'm Michael to. here. We have two movies. What are the movies? Today we're going to do Audition and Blood Feast. In that order, In nonetheless. In that order. At this point, I may officially know more about Japanese cinema than Japanese music. Wow. That's and, saying a lot. Uh, so Japanese music, I know zero about. Okay. So Japanese cinema, I started at about negative 23. Yeah. And uh, I've been slowly working my way up. I So this is the first time I actually did no additional research on Audition. Okay. Uh, Blood Feast, I know lots about Herschel Gordon Lewis because right. I think he's the most interesting, <laughs> fascinating human being alive. Um, and I'll try and convey that uh, through another, another wonderful installment of our Herschel Gordon Lewis series. But um, Audition, I decided I'm going to go in cold. I'm going to attempt to understand a, a Takashi Miike movie I've already seen. And we're going to see how that goes yeah. in, in prep for the future uh, Rocky whatnots. Um, and I guess it's probably important to state that. You know what? How about we fucking try to spoil Audition? Okay. Let's <laughs> see if we can spoil Audition. That'll be our success rate. That's yeah. our pass or fail there. And then we'll, uh, we'll also go ahead and spoil Blood Feast. And if that bothers you and if that pisses you off and it gets your panties in a wad, then you can just chapter... How would you uh, how would you chapter over if you intended well, to do if that? If you have uh, some sort of Apple based program, an iPod or iTunes, <laughs> Apple based program, I like that. I believe it's called an iOS device. Is commonly uh, what those are. Either way, listen to on. There's uh, a chapter menu. Yeah. Here's what you do: Google it. People write in and they tell us they don't get how the chapters work and they're confused. Mm -hmm. It's not our job to explain to you how the chapters work. It's in a menu somewhere. I don't know what fucking device you're using. Just click around till you see chapters. It'll have the titles of the movies. It's built into the thing. So if you're listening to this, you can probably use chapters. Don't spoil the movies for yourself because you don't have five seconds to go on Google. Anyways, hey, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for listening to our show. Uh, let's talk about Audition. All right. So we need to cover a little ground. Where have we been with the Takashi Miike? Well, we first did Sukiyaki Western Django. Oh, I'm scared already. Paired that with Django. We're going to speak about Django a little bit later in the show today. Oh, exciting. Um, And we also did Takashi Miike with Ishii the Killer. Okay. In the same Argento, Miike, Gordon, Gordon Lewis, Lewis kind of yeah. thingy that we're doing. Thing going on there. So part of, I think, our decision with that is that if we tie Takashi Miike into these other directors we do kind of understand yeah or we claim to that we can understand him a little bit better yeah which is sort of working it's it gives me a it, false sense of security i was just gonna that say it makes enjoy. us feel like it's working yeah it absolutely does. if we can unwind from something like audition with something like blood feast <laughs> right. then that's just a victory for us yeah by the end of uh the two movies i forget that i don't know what i'm talking about yeah I think we should move away from the bombastic violence of the previous Takashi Miike stuff, which yeah. is, uh, I mean, Audition is a great different direction. You know, we talked about the thousand shades of Takashi Miike, uh -huh. how he's directed a billion and one films. Right. Since the last time we talked about him. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Since the last time he was name dropped on the show, I think he's directed another 15 things. That's probably not even a joke. I'm no. probably understating the amount yeah. of work this guy's doing. But with all of these different movies, we pick something else that's uh, extremely notable from his history. We already covered Ichi the Killer. That was a pretty big one. Mm -hmm. We decided, uh, let's do Audition, because that's another one everybody talks about, and maybe it'll help everybody kind of understand his stuff a little bit more. Also, maybe people won't just skip over this episode of <laughs> Double Feature, which would also be great. So Audition, is a, it's a new direction for Takashi Miike, because we move into the, uh, the romantic comedy Right. Uh, which is something that we haven't seen with Takashi Miike before because we've That been you doing... and I haven't. Right. It's, it's, it, cause we've seen, you know, a lot of violence and a lot of, uh, weird shit. But this is just, I mean, the audition is just a straight 
rom-com all the way through till the end. <laughs> Definitely until the very end. And uh, you don't want to get spoiled, so chapter away and see you later. Um, okay, so before we get to the second half of this <laughs> film, uh, they hatch a plan, all right? So I, we really need to talk about the, uh, the split halves here. Maybe yeah. that's the technician in me coming out. But there's distinctly uh, separate components uh-huh. of this uh, film that, let's say, need to be isolated. They hatch a plan, and I love this fucking plan. This is during the romantic comedy portion before the horror torture portion of the film. Uh, they hold this kind of, all right, so this guy's wife dies, and he's looking for, let's say, a new potential mate, and they don't have the internet. So what he does is holds a film audition slash speed dating session, Mm -hmm. which I think is actually kind of brilliant, right? Because he wants to hook up with an actor. Right. So why not hold an audition? I would say it's actually suspiciously similar to my own life. (laughs) These double features are kind of just turning into, you know, Eric's dating nightmares. We've got to stop letting you pick these. Well, I mean, never do I get a forum where I can vent and complain about my personal problems in a way that no one I know will ever hear. That's true. Because if I do it on my podcast, no one I know will ever listen to this. Not in a million years. I can say anything I want. No one I know will hear. Right? This is a vault of information, personal information for you and I. And no no one will ever find these recordings, ever. I'm not even being sarcastic. Neither am I. (laughs) Oh, why don't our friends listen to this show? Anyways. Of all the things that Audition does, it's the sincere commitment to it being a romantic drama, uh, a romantic comedy, really, that impresses me more than anything. And I mean, I, I want to recoil from that. Even now, even after having just seen it, I don't want to call it a romantic comedy. Right, but you've heard the score. <laughs> well, you well, know that's the big, score. That's, can I say that? I do. Yeah, you can say that. I know the score. I mean... <laughs> You call it a romantic drama because you know where it goes. Right. Uh, You feel like that's even a little bit. You know, when you're in the scenes, it's a fucking romantic comedy. That's a tribute to the film. That's how well it does. It really is. It transcends to romantic comedy. There's not even a hint in in this first half that it's going to become a horror movie. I mean, horror movies love to hint at this. This is a technique that's been used since Audition, uh, probably a little bit before Audition where you have a setup, we don't think we're getting into a horror movie, but up surprise, this is just where we found ourselves. Mm -hmm. And you and I love films where up surprise, look what kind of film this has turned into. Uh, Going back to From Dust Till Dawn, that's uh, that's Oh, that's a great example of that. Great example of that. But horror films feel the need, you know, when they do this, it's almost a requirement to hint early on. As if to say, just wait, we're going to get to the horror stuff. Sure. Well, it's Please almost don't a leave. warning. It's well, simultaneously it's, a hint and a warning. It's yeah. baiting and warning, depending on what you're there to see. But I don't know why horror movies ever feel the need to warn someone. It seems to to just be, um, they're pulling the rug out from under themselves. Yeah. Why wouldn't they just surprise and terrify everyone? Yeah, it's kind of weird that you would, because a horrific situation doesn't tend to foreshadow itself in the real world. <laughs> no, no. If you're about to end up in a place where all your friends are going to be killed... Sure. You don't drive by the killer at the supermarket no. before you get to the house. You uh, take a casual summer trip to Wolf Creek is what yeah. I think you do. Something right? like that. Yeah, is exactly it. Now, there are these brief odd scenes, uh, but if you don't know what's coming, I think it's it feels far more like, well, that didn't really belong there. That was kind of weird. And no second thought. Mm-hmm. You know, they cut to these scenes where we don't really have any context for what's happening. But it's not the usual, uh, I remember back to Spiral. We're always talking about Spiral because we fucking love Spiral. And not to discredit Spiral because it had exactly what it needed at the right moments. I love those little moments early on. But there are moments in Spiral where there are harsh music cues and scary things happening before the actual scary stuff really starts laying on, if ever. Um, Maybe Spiral is a bad example, but you know what I mean. There are definitive moments where... It's still early on. We don't know what's happening in the movie, but we get the sense, oh, this is a horror movie because this is the kind of tone we're getting. Here we just see, you know, a woman hanging out in an apartment and you might think, huh, wonder why we're getting that. And then it just goes to another scene. It's like Mm -hmm. it never even happened. Movie just says, ah, don't worry that that fell into the, you know, the movie's two hours 
The editors sure. can only watch it so many times. Well, that just accidentally fell in It's there. just a matter of Takashi Mika is doing so many projects that sometimes his reels get mixed up. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, that's almost true. That almost really feel... I just go, eh, fuck it. I don't know what that is. Keep going. You just reject it. You're just not... That's not a place for you right now. So while we're still in that romantic comedy portion, there's a lot of stuff that's pretty effective. There's that, uh, that bar scene, you know, where he's talking about his ideal girl. We're really getting to know him. It feels like a sort of, it's a hangout scene. It's mm-hmm. a getting to know your character sure. setup hangout scene. And that's where they start to hatch that plan. There's another one too, the, the sort of sad piano where he's looking through the headshots <laughs> and resumes. You know what I mean? It's a very, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a soft kind of emotional scene. You're yeah. feeling bad for the guy. You know, his wife died and here he is in this sort of desperate, I, I mean, honestly, sort of pathetic situation. Yeah. I think it's an amusing situation because I'm rather impressed with his idea to hold a (laughs) a farce audition, but actually a real audition so that it's not even a farce. It's it's one better. I'm impressed with that. Everyone else will think he's pathetic. That's kind of the idea there. There's another one, too, with the the girls telling him, uh, you know, I hurt my hip. I can't do ballet. Right. I mean, it's almost touching. Yeah. You're almost thinking, oh, poor girl. She she can't do ballet anymore. Even though you've seen the cover of the movie yeah. and probably the DVD menus and you know she's the creepy fucking girl from the... You know where this is yeah. going. Does anyone not know where Audition is going? Uh, probably not because I'm not even sure where Audition went by the <laughs> end of it. But you know what I mean. There's there's uh, some there's, there's, some heavy stuff coming. Yeah. Well, there's an expectation of Audition that yeah, it has right. to live up to. I think the part that feels most like a romantic comedy is when they're doing the auditions with the uh, you know the music and the funny questions. These guys yeah. are the two yeah. guys are asking these well because it's a ruse because they want to find out if they're sure it's ideal almost dates. like the dating it's like the dating game right it's and just one sided so there's something very comedic about asking questions completely inappropriate for an audition I guess even uh, the nature of hatching that plan all of that stuff is funny it is a romantic comedy it does feel funny you get away from it and you don't want to call it that. But when you're in the moment, it's a romantic comedy. And then it gets uh, increasingly weird from there. Now, the great thing about this is we can uh, visit a moment that you and I used to used to get to visit a lot when you were introducing me to horror films, Yeah, which is the where do you know moment. <laughs> now, we've gotten pretty good at this and yeah. we know what we're getting into and For we've sure. seen a lot of this stuff before. But in audition, every time I see audition, because the line is kind of fuzzy. Mm-hmm. There's always a... Uh, did you say lion? No, I said lion. Oh, we'll get to lion later. My bad. No, the lion is definitely not fuzzy. It's <laughs> uh, covered in vomit from its dinner. Gross. When do you know? I mean, when are you sure? I mean, do you ever know? You know, I don't ever really... There, It does so much dancing around where it almost seems like he keeps waking up from dreams. Sure. That I don't think I ever... I honestly don't know what's going on right. really <laughs> until he's on the floor in that apartment. But, With needles in his eyeballs? Yeah, but there's moments where he sees the tongue flailing on the ground or even just that first time that the um, the grown-up bag cat slams itself into the wall. So you've 100% connected the girl. You know that that's as soon as you see her walk in for the audition, you know she's up to trouble. I just feel, yeah, I think there's something there. It's, uh, I mean, as soon as that bag starts to move, yeah. Here, here's the deal with the fucking bag, right? So while he's sleeping, you know, it cuts to her by the phone, right? And there's the bag, and then you know, it cuts to her by the phone again, and in the background, there's a big fucking bag, and then uh, she's behind a tree, and we come back like it's no big deal. None of that <laughs> meant anything. I mean, he's having reservations. I don't know, you know, yeah, he's having see, a that's trippy the thing dream. Is you can never tell what's a dream and what's her in her apartment. But we come back two or three times to this scene of the telephone in the bag, which is great because visually it looks way different yeah. than the rest of the movies. Uh, it looks more like something out of Hostel or Texas Chainsaw Massacre than it does out of a romantic comedy. Yeah. Even a Shaun of the <laughs> Dead-esque romantic comedy. Which is right? just a romantic comedy with zombies. Now, the bag thing is so good and so talked about, it honestly makes me not want to mention it. It makes me not want to discuss it on the show. But I mean, we have to talk about that stupid fucking bag, right? I know we've mentioned it before a couple times. Yeah, uh, if you go to uh, doublefeatureshow.com slash bagcat, uh, (laughs) you'll basically see what we're talking about. I don't think that's... 
No, this is what happens when you don't let the cat out of the bag. Oh. What you could do is go to uh, the website and look up every time we've mentioned audition using the uh, search over there, and you'll probably find it quite a few times. But I mean, what the fuck? It just sits there out of the frame, right? Uh-huh. Or, or out of the, um, the focal point, yeah. out of the focal area of our frame. The, and it's the just... The depth of field. Hey, look at you. <laughs> but it's just, hey, I'm a bag. I'm just sitting here. This is the great thing about this stupid fucking bag. This girl's sitting next to it. She's hunched over. We're showing her spine. We know this is a bad time waiting for us over <laughs> here. But Michael, it's a fucking bag. It's just a dirty potato sack. It's probably just That's, it's probably just PE equipment, to it be honest. It literally could be anything inside that bag. Yeah. And I think that at the very core, that's what's terrifying about yeah. this <laughs> is you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, if it's a sleeping monster, right? If it's a monster that's fallen asleep and they keep going back to it, you know it's going to wake up, right? Yep. I mean, if it's a a scary lit doghouse, you know a big fucking monster dog is going to come out of it and try and eat you. Yep. You generally have an idea. If it's a hole in the floor, you know a spike's going to come out and get you in the fucking eye. Yeah. You don't know what's going on with it. And it's sealed. What, is the bag going to rip open? Something's going to leap at you? What the fuck is going to happen with this goddamn bag? It's really just a terrifying mystery that they sit on for a long time. (laughs) They do. For 40 minutes. Yeah. So by the time the, the bag springs its terrifying trap... It's been 40 fucking minutes. This is what I'm talking about when I say their commitment to romantic comedy. Yeah. It really is about half the movie yep. that they spend doing this. And by taking that amount of time, you really do trick your audience. The audience knows it's coming. And you can't do anything in today's day and age to prevent that. We have DVD menus. <laughs> you know, even in digital copies, they have poster art. and You have to lure your audience in somehow. Right. So unless you made this film for one other person and no one knows about it, your secret is out. But what you can do is make them forget by bringing them through 40 minutes of a laugh riot, of a sad tragedy, of, you know, of this romance And then by the time we get to the bag, you're giving them anxiety about what the fuck could be in the goddamn bag. And uh, and when literally anything could happen, you get a lion sound. The bag rolls over and (laughs) smacks itself into the wall. I mean, you're really that's not the thing you're expect. You want the bag to open or something to rip out of the bag. You want the answer. But instead, it just raises more questions. It's it certainly does raise more questions. And it uses that sound that instinctively to the human ear says danger. Mm hmm. The fucking animal it said, roaring lion It either lion says sound. danger or MGM. So, I mean, I want to make some kind of reference to Pandora's box opening, Pandora's bag or something. The Pandora's bag. But really, the thing in the bag makes the most sense out of anything that happens in the rest of this movie. I don't know if that's true or not. I think the thing in the bag is kind of a mystery. There is the the ballet teacher, the mm-hmm. uh, piano person guy. Yeah, with the wheelchair. weird feet in the wheelchair. Don't know what the, the Quentin Tarantino character. The ballet teacher that, by the way, is not going down on her. Yeah. Because after three episodes in a row, all manner of clit licking has been (laughs) banned from double feature. Yeah, we can't allow that. I'm just kidding. That ban would never happen. Eventually, the torture comes in. So we get the strange ballet guy and we get the thing in the bag that needs to be fed vomit or whatever. Mm-hmm. Which is so stomach turning. It's awful. It it's just, horrendous. The thing in the bag doesn't even really do anything. It just no. It is just has a funny and hand gross. and likes vomit a lot. Oh my god. Which is, I mean, really, that's all something has to do to be the worst thing anyone has ever put in a movie. It's true. <laughs> and then the torture comes in. Yeah. And uh, when the torture comes in, it's slow and it's quiet. Yeah, and it's weird. It's uncomfortable. It's almost like she's playing a game where she stabs needles into painful parts of the human body. It's a game with no rules and one player. And then essentially around the time you go, well, he's probably grown accustomed to getting needles shoved (laughs) under his eyes. This is only going to be better for him from now on. Right. She takes, you know, the good old fashioned spy weapon of piano wire. Ugh. And uses it to happily saw off his feet at the ankles. (laughs) I know. She's got this huge smile on her face while she cuts off his foot with what I can only assume is dull piano (laughs) wire because it takes some work. While her dance instructor masturbates. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That happens too. Because why wouldn't that be juxtaposed together? It's fabulous. The joy she takes in it, really, it is Ichi the Killer all over again. Yeah. It's Kakihara again. 
So that torture comes in and it's slow and quiet and deliberate and awful. And I mean, there's a long take in the beginning where it just looks like Takashi Miike's tripod has fallen over and it's <laughs> camera's just going to sit there forever and record till it runs out of tape. I assume all these fucking Japanese movies are filmed on videotapes. And the camera from there, I mean, it's in these haphazard places. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, we don't have time for camera setup. Just fucking put it over here. Get some needles. Yeah, it seems like they're trying to capture an extremely urgent situation as well as they can without getting in its way. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) If you have trouble deciphering it, you probably haven't read the uh, book of ancient weird religious rites. I think that would be the problem there yeah ancient weird religious rites is actually a really important novel that comes into play in this film um that we're doing today called blood feast which is it's one of the higher end films we've ever covered um (laughs) really the reason we're touching on it is because it has to do with i'm uh, sorry i have to interrupt you all the women in rogers park right now need to stay indoors (laughs) i uh it's supposed to take place in Miami or something, but what? Rogers Park, yeah. Rogers Park is I know, in Chicago. This is, this is news to you, right? It's I've, got I've, palm I trees or something in it. I thought it was supposed to take it. place in Chicago. Herschel Gordon-Lewis doesn't know where this movie takes what place. What the fuck? I'm, I'm really disappointed You're now. upset by this? Fuck. Yeah, it, there's palm trees. There's no palm trees in Chicago. Whatever. There's palm trees in Rogers Park. All right, that's There's fine. weird shit in Rogers Park, man. The first time I saw this movie, uh, as I referenced last episode, I was delirious. Yeah. Now, I know we uh, we chatted about Reanimator a little bit. We did. Um, that was one of the Music Box uh, films we didn't really get to cover a ton. That was from, I think, our second Music Box show. Uh-huh. Back from our first Music Box show, we covered some Blood Feast. We did. Well, we mentioned that Blood Feast aired. At the time we recorded, it was somehow even hazier than uh, than it was before we watched it this time. But it was late. That was the thing. It was yeah. very late at the Music Box Massacre. And I was not depending on uh, how you call that time. I believe it was right before Black Sabbath, which is the one I slept through. Yeah, everybody was fair. I mean, I don't want to make it seem like I just powered through (laughs) the fucking massacre and looked over at you like, what the hell is your problem? I fell asleep during the 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 next one. Oh yeah, I didn't even fall asleep. I was just a lunatic. Yeah, I fell asleep during Black Sabbath, which is why the music box shows were a terrible idea, and we're slowly cleaning up the. I don't think we have another one for a while, but uh, just by coincidence, we got a couple. We got a couple. Let's fix the music box shows sure. <laughs> episodes. Well, we wasted uh, a lot close. of films uh, by just kind of burning through them. Forty-eight hours of films we probably could have talked about. So, what is this blood feast thing? First of all, I'd like to point out there is an original score by Herschel Gordon Lewis. Wow! So it's he's the he's, uh, he's the one man with the vision. He's the one man with the uh, the drum. There. Oh. What kind of drum is that? I don't know, like a a lame a drum, a lame drum. Yeah, I th- believe it's that's this the... light, repetitious drum score. It's um, and a piano. Yeah, there and is kind a... Of a sound. Yeah, there's definitely some of that. And this is one of those less is more type of scores, though. Oh, I, I mean, thought you were going to say don't... less is more type of films. Well, it's definitely that too. But uh, I really like this score for as stupid as it is. Yeah. I think it's uh, it's one of the best things we've seen since the eyes wide shut two note <laughs> piano score. Well, because you just you feel it. You know what I mean? Right. The score is if you heard that score, you would think Blood Feast. Right. And when you're at that midnight fucking movie, <laughs> you think Blood Feast. It, well, it feels has, like what it is. It certainly has its moments, like the uh, the low tuba hit when the girl dies. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. I, I noted as we were kind of watching the film that this is just like, it's like watching a Looney Tunes cartoon yeah, with yeah. blood. That's the feeling. It's not the content and it's not the story, but the No, the I got that feeling colors, too. I think that's spot on. It just seems like a live action cartoon. Yeah. And uh, it's awesome. It's so much fucking fun. I just laughed the whole time. You know what makes it fun for me as well as the organ? I think uh, we yeah. can't leave out the organ. There isn't... The one a... that he pulls out of the girl's chest? No, not that one. I wrote in my notes, Michael may make organ joke <laughs> attempt to cut him off, but I failed. Uh, I think the organ in the score is where most of the charm of the movie comes for me. And that seems like such a silly thing to say, but it's just so perfect. It just hits that sweet spot that makes me want to watch Blood Feast. Yeah. What's funny about this is Herschel Gordon Lewis said this is a score that took him longer to write than it did to film and wow. edit the movie, which is ridiculous. Yeah, I think if I had to pick the one thing that keeps me coming back to Blood Feast, sure, sure. it would be uh, Fuad Ramses. Yeah. And just yeah. not only him as a character, but the fact that the film opens on first he kills somebody. 
Yeah. And then it's him at the store and they sure. know that there's a killer <laughs> sure. on the loose in the area. And he is the most suspicious <laughs> fucking guy. Yeah, right. He's just absolutely begging to be inquired about. Oh, you didn't like the Who Done It from Gorgor Girls? Fine. Let's uh let's just talk about Blood Feast. It's yeah, I mean, you see him right away. And he's everybody remembers Fuad Ramses. He's got the the rub in hair color and the wild eyes yeah it's the fucking eyebrows that are color it probably <laughs> it's just flower rubbed in his hair right uh, it's that kind of Herschel Gordon Lewis blue hair with yeah it's the fucking blue hair it. apparently stuff is rubbed in it because he's supposed to be old as yeah. he says later yeah I'm old uh, but no he's the same age <laughs> as everyone else and just has bad makeup I think it's less the performance that's remembered. And more how the camera awkwardly cuts to or hangs on him for right. an obnoxious amount of time, especially in that beginning scene. In the what? Who's the killer? Oh, sure. what's this catering or guy? Shakily zooms in on yeah. him. I mean, they show us the killer. They tell us the yeah. killer right away. There's no mystery here. But uh, that scene where he's, you know what the surprise is? Not that he's a killer, but that he's a fucking grocery store clerk. Right. That he's a catering clerk or gas station or i don't even know what Sells the fuck books. this place He's a bookstore food clerk egyptian goods merchant yeah there we go oh but we were talking about herschel gordon lewis doing the score yeah so that's one of his many new talents new fun sure. talents uh in addition to directing here patent pending he's um you know what there was a there was a long-standing rumor that he was a patent clerk or something Is the rumor started by our show uh, the rumor was started on double feature i think <laughs> last time we did <laughs> Uh, last time we did a show i don't think that's true i can't verify that anywhere it's just part of the giant collection of knowledge i think i have about herschel mm -hmm. gordon lewis sure we haven't mentioned this for a while but double feature not a place you go for facts yeah not, not a all. place for that unless it's about your romantic life so another fact that i made up is that he's also the radio announcer here i don't huh. think that's made up i think that's a real fact not a double feature fact but uh, he did a lot of the voiceovers, not even just in the movies, but for his trailers. And he's just voices in the various movies because he doesn't want to pay an actor. Uh -huh. This is actually the reason he doesn't want to pay more people uh, for his films. So last Herschel Gordon Lewis episode, uh, the Gorgor -Gor Girls sure. episode of Double Feature, we found out that uh, everybody knew him as the author of The Businessman's Guide to... I think it's advertising and sales promo or right. something. Yeah, that's uh, our old Herschel Gordon Lewis. No one actually knows him from that, but he did write that book. He wrote a bunch of books. Aside from being the director and uh, apparently the composer of this movie. And the photographer. He was also the manager at a radio station. There's okay. a little Herschel Gordon Lewis factoid <laughs> for you. Uh, what else did he do? He was the studio director at a TV station. Okay. That was another thing that he did. All right. These are all in weird places, too, like Nebraska and Oklahoma so or So he's just making ends meet. He wasn't doing shit. He apparently made something like 30 films or shorts in uh, what's called the nudie cutie genre uh -huh. before he actually did Blood Feast. All right. So Blood Feast is where the gore of HGL actually begins. Well, yeah, that was the whole thing, right? As he was doing these little shorts with nudity, mm -hmm. this kind of, uh, it was sort of softcore stuff. Sure, American pink, let's call it that. Let's well, coin the term. <laughs> no, we're not going to call it American pink. We'll save that for when something amazing like actual <laughs> American pink films come out. I'll make them if they don't show yeah. up eventually. When we talked about Russ Meyer, we did Faster Pussycat on the show, but we also did um, Russ Meyer's Up on the show. We'll get to more Russ Meyer stuff, but we talked about how he started in the Nudie Cutie films, too. It's, uh, I, I would call it maybe even a pre-genre rather than a sub-genre, how sure. preposterous that is. Wow, well, that's just a bunch of made-up shit. But exploitation. Yeah. Well, before exploitation knew what it was, people uh -huh. just made films with naked people women. People just made exploitative movies. Well, this is what happens <laughs> with technology, right? A new piece of technology comes out, and you get naked in front of it. Right, right? like I the mean, piss faxer. I I believe that was the first thing FaceTime was used for, actually. Was piss faxing? <laughs> no. So this guy had a camera, and he filmed girls being naked. And then he, uh, immediately following that, uh, people often cite, okay, pornography is the first thing you do with new technology. The second thing you do is monetize pornography made with new technology. Yeah, that makes plenty of sense to me. So that's what he was doing. And he made like 30 of these things. I mean, a ton of them with uh, David Friedman. So David Friedman... 
we kind of know, kind of don't know. Sure. Well, his he's got his name on the producer credit. There's yeah. a what's it said? It said uh, Friedman Lewis Production. With yeah, a slash. right. You know that was their little production company. Sure. They made uh, a bunch of this stuff. Clever By the time name. we got to Gorgor Girls, he had split off. Okay. Um, he was doing stuff on his own for actually for a little while, but he made these next couple films with David Friedman as well. Uh, Blood Feast and the stuff that followed. David Friedman's kind of an interesting guy. Mm-hmm. So he was a producer on Lewis's stuff. But, um, you know, we talked, remember during Sukiyaki and when we talked about Django? Very much. We talked about... Um, the sequels. Yeah, how there were a million Django's. Sure. People just made up their own Django because yeah. you could do yeah. that. We never really got to the bottom of what the fuck happened there. Uh-huh. And if Herschel Gordon Lewis was actually a patent clerk, maybe he could fill us in. <laughs> but it uh, turns out not the case. So David Friedman wrote a movie called Nude Django. Okay, so I'm just assuming that's just Django with no clothes. Same plot, everything's exactly the same, but everybody's naked. You know, it's one of those movies that you probably can't even find. That's yeah. just what I assume sure. about. It's probably on a VHS cassette in someone's basement. It's hard enough to find the the movies that Herschel Gordon Lewis has done, you know, to find an obscure David Friedman movie, I don't know. He also executive produced two more recent movies, uh-huh. um, the 2001 Maniacs sequels. The Field the, of Screams and... Yeah, you got it. That other, that other, other one, right. Those are really bad. Yeah, you know, I think you've mentioned that a couple times. So you've seen yeah. these and they're not good. Yeah, um, we're going to we're gonna actually talk about uh, Tim Sullivan, who did the first 2001 Maniacs. And I believe he's involved with the other ones. We're gonna so talk you about will him. finally elaborate on what these what Yeah, these but I'm not going to... I'm just suffice to say, David... When you complain about something as often as you complain about those sequels, I don't even bother. Yeah. I instantly, those go out of my Netflix queue immediately. Yeah. I, uh, I I just wouldn't recommend them. Well, let's end on a positive note then. David Friedman did uh, one other awesome thing, okay. which was Ilsa, She-Wolf of the SS. Oh, that's a great movie. Yeah. She's got big boobs and she kills everyone. Um, as you might imagine, he's not venturing too far out of the genre. So when they were doing these nudie cutie films, okay. I think the last one they did was... Uh, Bell Bear and Beautiful, something of that effect. Wow. They finished that movie and then they started on Blood Feast literally the next day. Okay. Wasting no t- kind of like when we're working on double feature. Sure. We will finish doing double feature something one night and start double feature something <laughs> the next morning. This literally takes our entire lives, people. So this movie took a week to do, which by the way is also how long an episode of Double Feature takes to do. <laughs> And they take the profits from this movie and they turn around and film 2000 Maniacs. Uh huh. So that was another one where we did, uh, you know, I mean, 2001 Maniacs was sure. the take on, uh, on that movie. But 2000 Maniacs, the Herschel Gordon Lewis version, not the one that we originally covered on our show, was probably the other most successful Herschel Gordon Lewis movie. Yeah. I would still say Blood Feast is one of the most well-known. But, I would definitely agree. You know, 2000 Maniacs is up there, and so is... The Wizard uh, of Gore is pretty high up there, Wizard too. of Gore, Gruesome Twosome. Um, you think they're the, the more well-known ones, but try and find them to watch well, anywhere. Well, I mean, try it's to like, it's, try. If, you could, if you and I listed the more well-known blah, blah, blah of anything... We're the only people that actually know what that is. <laughs> sure. Well, that's not always true. Uh, people know what audition That's right. Is. There's us and Podmanity, but anybody on the street has no fucking idea. Yeah, I always worry about that. I always worry that we have descended into obscurity and treated it like it's every day. Because we try and make things more accessible, but sometimes we just start talking about stuff. Yeah, like blood and people feast. don't care. It's weird when you go into something like talking about a director, right? Mm. For example, we're doing Blood Feast today, and I'll sure. go out... And people will say, oh, what'd you do for double feature? And I'm like, oh, we did uh, Blood Feast. And they won't know what it is. And I won't expect them to know what it is. But then I'll say, oh, it's a Herschel Gordon Lewis film. And expect right. that is where they get on board. Sure. And go, oh, okay. Yeah, I know. I kind of got an that idea. That one guy, sure. But then they kind of cock their head. Sure, yeah. And go, I don't know what you're talking about. Have you done The Other Guys? Yeah, <laughs> right. Have you reviewed The Other Guys on your show? You ever uh, review Will Ferrell movies? <laughs> That name didn't even sound comfortable coming out of my mouth. Will Farrell. Is that really his name? I believe that's his name. Will Farrell. Yeah. Ugh. Also the word review coming out of my mouth felt pretty gross. In my head, I'm just thinking R E V U E. I don't take any amount of pride in that. I don't like the obscurity. You know, I want him I want people to go out and see Herschel Gordon Lewis sure. movies. 
I don't like being part of this tiny little club where, oh, I know about Herschel Gordon Lewis. Well, I think look how what, cool I am. I think a lot of what we're trying to do, especially on Double Feature, is to get people to actually <clears throat> watch the fucking <laughs> movies. You couldn't have gone with films? No. If I said that, people would get confused in chapter, right. um, chapters, menu. But I think that's what we try to do is we try to just pick movies and hope people will watch them based on the fact that we did, I don't know, popular movies. We did The Rock. Blood Feast isn't a bad spot to start because it's the the first one. It's where the splatter genre came from. It's uh, funny. It's funny. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a good time watching it. But also, this is a really unique point in Herschel Gordon Lewis's career, too, because I think of it as the first one, despite the fact he made 30 shorts or whatever uh-huh. uh, feature length stuff was thrown in there before this. Because usually as a filmmaker's career goes on, they get more professional with mm-hmm. each film, unless they do like a strange Soderbergh return to indie, you know, whatever. But uh, in most cases, as the films go on, the films look glossier, at least up to a point. This movie is about the middle of his overall career and looks the most professional of anything. And I mean, we did. Gore, Gore Girls. Mm-hmm. If you saw Gore, Gore Girls, if you didn't, that's another Herschel Gordon Lewis movie. Now you know about two of them, and I can talk to you about Herschel Gordon Lewis. Awesome. That didn't look nearly as professional as this, and that was towards the end of his career. Right. It really just kind of goes downhill from here. Mm-hmm. And I think that's because he learned to cut corners. Yep. He basically saw what moviegoers would tolerate, and he continued yeah. to push the uh, boundaries yeah. there. I think he he was trying to figure out where to go above and beyond a title. Yeah. (laughs) If people would pay to see the title of a film and nothing on the reel, I think he would have just stopped there. Yeah, but everything else cost additional money. (laughs) And so it was just a matter of taking out the elements till it was uh, no longer fiscally irresponsible, artistically irresponsible, fiscally. He wouldn't even like it being called art. He said uh, he's quoted as saying something about how uh, he sees filmmaking as a business and he pities anyone who thinks it's an art form. Yeah. <laughs> that's so I mean we have found out since we did the last Herschel Gordon movie. I know you and I we kind of felt bad cuz we kept making jabs at it but then said, "Well, I think Herschel Gordon Lewis knows his movies are yeah. shit." In fact, he does. He does. He uh, prefers he's been that, that way. widely quoted as <laughs> uh, as saying such. Well, when he made Blood Feast, he uh you know, he says not only was he not taking it seriously, he thinks even then, you know, he slanders his own film as saying, even though he thinks it's supposed to be funny, he still thinks it's fucking yeah. awful on top of that. Most people think it's a straight movie mm-hmm. and they laugh at it. He thinks he was being funny and it's still terrible. Yep. Herschel Gordon Lewis's opinion of his own film, <gasps> but he recognizes it being the first of its sure. kind. So we talked about Ramsey's. I want to mention really briefly uh, Connie Mason's in this film. She's Suzette, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, she was a Playboy bunny. She's really just in, I mean, she's an extra in a couple bigger movies, a Bond movie and something. But she um, she's in a couple Herschel Gordon things. And apparently she is the worst actor on the planet. <laughs> so I've read. she The stuff in this movie, she's been known to, one, delay productions. But two, the stuff in this movie... You see nothing on the screen that Herschel Gordon Lewis didn't painstakingly tell her to do. Wow. Apparently, she is a little more than a rag doll uh, as far as acting in a film. Jeez. But she was a Playboy model. So you see where you know sure. his priorities lie. So what the fuck happens in this movie? Oh, I mean, that's pretty simple. This one I get. Because I don't know if you can describe this movie without sounding like you're insane. Essentially, there's some Egyptian religious guy who decides sure. to have a blood feast in order to bring back the goddess Ishtar and he uses the vehicle of some girl's birthday party or whatever because <laughs> uh, he needs to oh, sacrifice God, someone. Um, Herschel Gordon Lewis didn't write this unfortunately because and then, it's pretty magic. And then uh, the town discovers him before he ends up resurrecting Ishtar and he tries to hide in a garbage truck which isn't an intelligent place to hide. You know, we got through uh, we got through without mentioning Eric Friedman when we were talking about the eyebrows, but now you're starting to talk about Garbage Day, and I don't know how much longer I can contain uh, myself. I actually just wanted to see if I asked you about what happens in this movie, how long it would take to get to the word Egyptian. For the record, you got through three words first yeah. before Egyptian came up. Egyptian. Everything's fucking Egyptian in this movie. Yeah. 
the entire town. I mean, okay, so here's another Herschel Gordon thing. He was also an English teacher, huh? You know, for decades. I mean, for a long time, he taught at a pretty high level, and uh, that's probably why everybody in this movie is into some kind of like Egyptian studies why class or something. Books. Why the whole town, regardless of job or age or class, all have an appreciation for higher education. It's like the show Community. They're just all in the same study group. Yep. That's why these characters have come together. Some chick's birthday party. And even with exhausting the plot at this point, they still haven't reached an hour and seven minutes, which is <laughs> apparently what it takes to make a film. That has to be a new all-time low for double feature. I think it's, yeah, it's pretty for close. For what we've considered feature-length yeah. uh, movies. But, I mean, as you go through this movie and watch where they could have trimmed things as well, because there's a lot of scenes that sure. hang on for really dear life. Uh, these long takes, especially the girl's body uh -huh. at the end, yeah. where uh, it's the, what, leftover scraps or what? It looks like an entire body to me. Yeah, but it's the scraps. Apparently the leftovers from the <laughs> feast. There's just this long fucking take just buying time. <laughs> it's ridiculous. They just keep panning down. And then the camera refuses to leave the scene with the right. actors. The actors leave. Camera hangs out there. Thinks you might want to see her hand. Really check out her hand. <laughs> really, have you seen her hand? This is a full movie, people. But we do finally escape. I mean, you know, garbage day and, sure. and all. We eventually tear ourselves away from the scene and the gumshoes, I don't know, phone it in or whatever they're doing. Sure. At Big the answer. end, some people do some acting. And uh, we get the fuck out of here. But... I have great news. Oh, good. We can't possibly be done with Herschel Gordon Lewis yet. Okay. Because while I might not drag someone through another, you know, color me blood red or gruesome twosome or uh -huh. uh, what is it, scum of the earth? Is yeah. that, um, come on. I actually can't think of any of the other lyrics from that song. Um, and, and that's a lie. We'll probably drag people through <laughs> one yeah. or more of those movies. But there is, in fact, a blood feast too. How can we not do Blood Feast? And, and this is even better. It's within the last decade. Wow. Herschel Gordon Lewis, I, I think I mentioned this. He stops making films after Gorgor Girls, which is what, 72 or something? Yeah. And then decades later, uh, makes another movie. Blood Feast 2. So I want to know what Herschel Gordon Lewis has been doing in the interim and what the fuck Blood Feast 2 looks like. Yeah, I guess we'll have to check that out. Definitely. We have a website, it's doublefeatureshow.com. And you can email us. You know what? Email us through the contact form on the website. Whoa. Also, we're on the social network, so you can go on that site and add us if yeah. you can navigate your way around I try to there. keep up with that. I click the little thumbs up guy a lot. Um, what are we doing next time on the show? Next time, we're going to do uh, some uh, ugly guy something something with the personal tragedies. Uh, we're going to do The Wrestler and Rolling Thunder. Well put. Watch more fucking film. Bye.